Let's continue developing our qualitative understanding of how light comes from semiconductors, especially from diodes. I want to turn your attention to indirect gap semiconductors. And just to remind you, the band structure looks well as shown here. The valence band and the conduction band are offset from each other in K space. That means in order for a charge carrier, an electron to jump between the valence band and the conduction band, it also needs to undergo a momentum change, in particular, a direction change of this momentum. And that can be very, very difficult to accomplish. An incoming photon, for example, can't give that much momentum to an electron. And as an electron jumps from conduction down to valence, it can't give up a photon with that much momentum. So we need to find ways to assist the momentum change. And so in general, indirect gap semiconductors aren't very efficient emitters. And examples I would give you are that we've talked about are silicon germanium and gallium phosphide. And I'm going to stick with gallium phosphide. They do emit, but they just don't do it efficiently. I'm going to talk about some of the tricks used to uh, enable the emission of, of light. With gallium phosphide, what happens if you dope it with nitrogen? So nitrogen will replace some of the phosphorus atoms in phosphorus lattice sites, therefore. The thing about nitrogen is it's more electronegative than phosphorus, meaning it attracts electrons. So the conduction electrons in the semiconductor will have a tendency to uh, congregate around the nitrogen atoms. And that means you know where the electrons are. Now, how does that help us? How does that give a kick to their momentum? If the nitrogen atoms are attracting electrons, then those electrons become localized. And if they're localized, they have a very small delta X, and per Heisenberg, they have a very large delta P momentum. Delta K and delta P are essentially the same thing, just related by H bar. And so now you can have a very big delta K for an electron. If that delta K is large enough to overcome this offset in the valence and conduction bands, an electron can more easily go between the two bands. And that's the basic idea of an isoelectronic center. The nitrogen provides the range of Ks needed. That is, if the electrons have an uncertain K, there's a good chance an electron will have a large enough K that it can make this horizontal leap. That's one trick, isoelectronic centers. But I don't know, semiconductors work in LEDs. To answer that, we just need to consider some back of the envelope ideas here. First of all, a semiconductor is full of electrons, and those electrons are, are zipping around at their thermal velocity of about uh, 10 million centimeters per second. They have a, a certain lifetime. It varies a lot. Recombination times vary over several orders of magnitude. But some might be like silicon around 10 to the minus 6 seconds. If an electron takes 10 to the minus 6 seconds, one microsecond, to find a hole and to create a photon, how far does it go in that time? It goes 10 centimeters. But devices aren't that big. You know, a typical device is less than 1 micron across. So the distance needed to turn electrons and holes into photons is considerably larger than the size of a device. And so that's why the recombination time, long recombination times of some materials, make them also poor emitters. It prevents electrons and holes from finding each other and becoming a photon. We gotta find a way for commercial products to work. We need to find a way to convince electrons and holes to kind of hang out together in one spot long enough because they, they, they move like this. We have to make a little um, uh, detention center for electrons and holes where we just hold them for at least a microsecond so that they can turn into photons. And that's what's accomplished with the hydrostructure structure shown here. You take a gallium phosphide substrate, that is the bulk materials, gallium phosphide, as depicted on the right, and you p-dope it. So it's p-doped gallium phosphide. Gallium phosphide has a gap of a band gap of 2.26 electron volts, uh, and it's an indirect gap semiconductor. You take this as bulk gallium phosphide. This piece right here could be hundreds of microns thick, so it's it's not a film. And you deposit a thin film of aluminum indium gallium phosphide on top of it, 
And then on top of that, deposit another thin film of gallium phosphide, and you end dope the thin film of gallium phosphide. So you have uh, this sandwich here. Gallium phosphide, aluminum indium gallium phosphide, and gallium phosphide, where it's N-doped and P-doped on either side. Indium aluminum gallium phosphide has a smaller band gap, 1.8 to 2 electron volts, which is in the, it'll be uh, orange to red. The photons are generated in this region. That's where it happens. And they get in, they're in this region, and they have to get out the other end. So we have a little window over here for them to escape. And the, the gallium phosphide is transparent to those photons, by the way. Another thing is that uh, we, you have the terminals for biasing this so that you can inject a lot of carriers to get a lot of light. Put these terminals on here. The thing about coating a metallic thin film on epitaxial layer on top of an epitaxial layer is that the metallic thin film will be a very smooth surface. It's extremely reflective to light. It, any photons that hit that metal thin film will reflect off of it. And so that's really good. That helps us to force all the photons to go to the right. And if they do head off to the left, they get turned around. Then we put these bias terminals on these metallic pads, and the N type is bias negative, and the P type, which just has this tiny little pad, is bias positive. And the reason for the tiny little pad is to leave room for the light to get out. When you bias negative on the uh, N side and positive on the P side, it's forward biased. There is a, a band structure that we need to consider when you go and put these, put these three semiconductors together. Before you turn on the bias voltage, you can try to estimate what the band structure would look like given that the Fermi energy is flat for an unbiased semiconductor. It looks something like this. Now, the p-type is a substrate, so it's very thick, and so the scale is a little uh, uh, hard to depict here. This length right here could be hundreds of microns, and this length right here is probably 10 nanometers. So there, there's no uh, no comparing them. The conduction valence band edges on the, in the P side just, just look like flat horizontal lines. 2.26 electron volts apart. Same band gap for the end side. I'll show the band bending that happens across the thin film. Just think of it as it's there to ensure that the Fermi energy, which is get close to the conduction band in the end type material, and somehow has to be closer to the valence band in the P type, but the Fermi energy should be a flat line when we're not biased. That's why there's this bending, which may, may not be really accurately depicted. With the smaller band gap, you just you have no choice. You have to draw it smaller. And so you have the smaller band gap. What happens when you turn on the bias voltage? The negative terminal becomes a source of electrons. Electrons want to come out of it and go and go away from it. And so you start to pump electrons in here. The band edges move, so the dashed lines depict maybe where they were before you turned on the bias voltage. So with the bias voltage on, it's they're bent upward because you know the band edges go up when you turn on the negative voltage over here because electrons get higher energy in the presence of a negative terminal. So the these band edges go up. These electrons start to fill it up and holes start to fill up this, this semiconductor. So I'll show them. You have these electrons throughout the end type, lots of electrons, no, no, no real, real significant number of holes, just electrons in the end type. When you have this bias voltage on, the main effect is you reduce the height of this potential hill they need to get over in order to get out because the electrons definitely want to get away from the negative terminal over here. And so that's how I remember that the negative terminal over here has the effect of reducing the potential hill. So electrons start to go to the right, but they get to the aluminum, indium, gallium, phosphide thin film, and the band gap is smaller, so they fall into this lower area here. When you introduce electrons, they'll first go to the conduction band energy, right, and then start to fill states higher up. This is a well, and that's called a quantum well. So this aluminum, indium, gallium, phosphide film is the quantum well, and these electrons are held here for a good long time. Holes do the same thing. They're attracted to the left, to the negative terminal, so they go to the left, but when they get to the well, they fall into it. So these electrons and, and uh, holes are being detained, and they're being detained for, for, for plenty long for them to uh, recombine and make photons. So they do, they make a lot of photons, and the photons come out, and they, they go out, out the right side.
Because the band gap of the aluminum indium gallium phosphide is smaller than the band gap of the gallium phosphide, the photons pass through it without causing any electron transitions. A semiconductor is transparent to photons that are smaller than its band gap. They pass through and they, they come out the other side. That's the basic workings of a quantum well heterostructure LED, where the thin film right here is the quantum well. So as we uh, go forward, we're going to start to talk about something else that's important. One, one thing is, is what's the wavelength of these photons? You tune a certain band gap for this quantum well layer. It's not unknown in this region. You uh, tuned it. Remember, we talked about uh, alloying. This is an alloy. You choose the ratios and you get a band gap. This is fairly specific, but there is a broad distribution, a broadening to the, the line width of the emissions from the LED. And we're going to be talking about that next and then how we narrow that up to make a laser. Uh, so that's coming up.